Bună ziua, doamnelor și domnilor! Good afternoon and welcome everybody! It is both a pleasure and a privilege to moderate this plenary session, having distinguished speakers, Her Excellency Sizluminița uh, Odobescu, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania, and His Excellency Mr. Alberto Claveren Stork, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Chile. The title of this panel came almost naturally as we witnessed in uh, the last year and a half the most severe challenges to the international order, not only in this century, but probably since the global war that ended in 1945. The undermining of the law-based and rules-based international order is not only unprecedented in our lifetime, but it has already produced irreversible and lasting consequences. The only way out from here is to adjust, to adapt and identify opportunities inherent to any crisis, this one included. The aggression war launched by Russia against Ukraine is about destabilizing the whole global system by overlapping crises of which the military one is just the last deployed by the aggressor. We, on the other hand, know very well where competitions between great powers led in the past. Not once, but twice. What started in Europe went finally global and that would be even more valid today after decades of what we called globalization. Thus, the whole global community of law by operation through hybrid unconventional war methods is certainly not just a regional European war. Romania managed almost flawlessly an unprecedented crisis at NATO and the EU borders and, yes, we are seriously concerned by the recent developments, namely the Russian tendency to push the war towards the limits of NATO Black Sea territorial waters, by the illegal de facto blockade it tries to enforce, and by the, its withdrawal from the BSGI, which amounts to an open weaponization of food and the food crisis by Moscow. Nevertheless, the broad, correct vision of this huge magnitude crisis is the global one. This being said, with a aim to uh, simultaneously tackle challenges and grasp opportunities arousing from them, and um, without losing from sight the broader, truly global picture, we again welcome the two distinguished foreign affairs ministers, and we are eager to hear at and learn from their precious insight and experience. Thank you both again for being here with us today. And I now have the pleasure to give the floor to Her Excellency, Mrs. Luminita Odobescu, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania. Your Excellency, dear Alberto, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, today we are honored by the presence of His Excellency, uh, Minister Alberto Van Claveren Stork, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of uh, Chile, whom I warmly thank uh, for accepting uh, our uh, invitation. We are facing the challenges of our generation, maybe uh, greater than anything that the previous generation has seen. In order to navigate them, we must uh, be up to the task, but also be able to identify the opportunity in the context generated by these challenges. By us, I certainly understand the international community of democratic states and nations, which cherish, uh, value, and observe the international law, believing that the rules-based international order is not just a phrase but the cornerstone of our future in peace and prosperity. The challenges generated by Russia's morally bankrupt and hugely destructive aggression against Ukraine have generated unprecedented systemic threats. They are the gravest uh, in the 21st century and probably the worst since the end of the Second World War. We can grasp their negative impact on our daily lives. 
Romania's sections in this context, our diplomacy long exercised tradition in multilateralism, and our firm adherence uh, to the set of European and Euro-Atlantic values have uh, reinforced our, our status and reputation as an active uh, member of the global democratic uh, community. We are a democratic country, as such, bear the responsibility of promoting democracy, human rights and freedom, the international rule of law and the importance of free markets. We are fully supportive of Ukraine because it is our neighbor and the valued member of the European family, because it is a victim of a brutal and provoked illegal war of aggression, because it is on the side of the international law, and the whole legitimacy of the international system is at stake in Ukraine's struggle against Russia's invasion. And we, Romania, support Ukraine with everything we can. What it is at the stake in this war, more than in any other since the Second World War, is an entire set of rules and institutions that allow us to experience an unprecedented era of mostly peaceful development. This is why fundamentally every single country in the world should support Ukraine, not just for Ukraine's sake, not just, just for uh, democracy's sake, but for its own sake. Every signatory state of the UN char Charter should see that the threats posed by Russia go against the interests of each and every country. If aggression against Ukraine pays off even partially for Russia, nobody will be safe. Others may feel encouraged to accept the risk of resorting the, to war and aggression. Such a reality would not only affect Europe, but the entire world. Therefore, as the time for political slogans has passed, we must all openly address our core pragmatic interests to be protected from arbitrary, brutal use of force. Dear colleagues, the way that lies ahead of us is not an easy one. The world is changing like never before, geopolitically, economically, technologically, demographically, in all the fields, I would say. Continue to adapt uh, to changes, to secure authentic partnership, and to identify equally opportunities requires ambitious efforts. As in every crisis, there are also opportunities. I'm confident that our success in strengthening the defense of our strategic interests in a deeply changing world will eventually reward our hard work and complex outreach efforts. I renew my thanks to my esteemed colleague and friend for honoring our invitation to attend um, and um, participate in this uh, year edition of the Romanian uh, Diplomacy uh, Reunion. We very uh, value very much uh, your presence uh, and uh, further contribution to our work. And uh, thank you all, dear colleagues, uh, for being active uh, and insightful participant to this uh, edition. I would like now to invite my colleague uh, to deliver his remarks and then to encourage uh, you, dear colleagues, to um, engage in an exchange uh, of, view, uh, of views uh, which will uh, uh, definitely benefit uh, our efforts uh, going further. Thank you. So, dear Alberto, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Luminilla. Your Excellency, Madam Minister, Mr. Secretary, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
In the first place, let me thank my colleague, Minister Orobescu, for inviting me to address you during this important annual event. It's an honor to speak to you, the ambassadors of Romania. Your country enjoys an important diplomatic tradition and faces now the challenge of coping with the gravest conflict which Europe confronts after the Second World War. Romania is also an integral part of the European Union and with its centuries old history has the singularity of having been a crossroads of Europe, a land and people influenced by contacts with various peoples and cultures, a land traditionally on the border of vast and mighty empires which have influenced its destiny, a land which is part of the Latin civilization, a condition which is not only shares with the Latin lands of Europe, but also with Latin America. Our world is increasingly complex. Globalization is still one of its main features, but slowing growth, increasing inequality, declining social mobility, erosion of democracy, poor responses to transnational problems such as terrorism and climate change are challenging it. We live in a digital era which seems to be speeding up our day-to-day -day reality. We are witnesses to a world in disarray, one far from peaceful. A world in which growing and evolving threats to the international community like terrorism, pandemics and humanitarian crises ignore national borders. A world in which we are witnessing the return of old forms of imperialism, of crude violations of the territorial integrity of neighboring countries, of wars, of conquest. The United States is no longer the sole hegemonic power. The arising tensions among the United States and Europe on the one hand and Russia on the other. And China's reach extends across the globe. Emerging powers in what we now call the global south question Western claims to be upholding a rules-based order. It's not simply that many governments had no say in creating these rules and therefore seem, see them as illegitimate. The problem is deeper. These countries also believe that the West has applied its norms selectively and revised them frequently to suit its own interests. Additionally, the rise of emerging powers has been hampered by a slow and painful recovery from the pandemic and faces an economic slowdown in China. In Latin America, growth, low growth rates appear to be the new normal, delaying our progress towards inclusive development. This world is no longer that of the post-war international order. The creation of the United Nations, NATO, the Marshall Plan, and the emergence of many international and regional organizations were symbols of those times. Today, our reality is different. It tends to be a reality of increasing fragmentation, of divergent conceptions of the international system, of competition between the great powers, and of different varieties of regionalism. We are witnessing the diffusion of power Social media empowers our citizens to challenge political systems and demand accountability through a kind of direct democracy. There is, above all, intense public scrutiny, changing both the behavior of our elites and the relationships between citizens and power. Rightly so, a Latin American, Moises Naim, in his book, The End of Power, points out that, and I quote, power is shifting from one continent or country to another. 
or it is dispersing among many new players. Power is undergoing a far more fundamental mutation that has not been recognized or understood. Power is decaying, he affirms, from boardrooms and combat zones to cyberspace. Battles for power are as intense as ever, but they are yielding diminishing results. Their fierceness masks the increasingly evanescent nature of power itself. Understanding how power is losing its value and facing up to the hard challenges this poses is the key to making sense of one of the most important trends reshaping the world in the 21st century. On the one hand, the emergence of groups like Daesh or Boko Haram is pushing radical projects that combine territorial dominance and worldwide expansion go beyond borders and institutions and are capable of destabilizing countries and regions. On the other, it is increasingly clear that states and multilateral organizations are no longer the only actors in the global and local stage. The loss of prestige by political parties has run parallel to the rise of NGOs responding to citizens' interests and demands, which the state and the international system appear sometimes unable to address. We are living a transition from a national and international order based on traditional democratic norms, separation of powers, public freedoms, regular elections, to a new order, one in which power is distributed in a different manner. More than a transition, today these realities coexist without agreement on what the new social organization will be. This hampers the effectiveness of national political systems, as well as the work and decision-making of international ones. To open new spaces for debate and participation certainly must become a priority worldwide, as is developing new tools for including new voices and views in the definition of priorities for international and national agendas. Recent studies highlight that technological advances have changed the world economy. No longer does success go in hand hand in hand with cheap labor or physical capital, but rather success is for those who innovate and create new products, services, and business models. It is those with good ideas who will reap the benefits of the new economy. It will be digital rather than financial or physical capital that will rule. It will be unicorns rather than traditional corporations who will take the lead in the world economy. We increasingly see how a few benefit disproportionately. In this context, we face a dual challenge. First, we must have the capacity to generate new ideas and new technologies. And second, we must ensure inclusive societies in these economic structures that benefit the few at the expense of, man, of the many. This challenge is shared by medium rent countries and we must cooperate within our regions to face it successfully. The development of science, technology, creative capacity and innovation also has an impact on the way power is distributed. As a result of new technological advances, renewable energies such as solar or wind are increasingly cheaper to produce foreshadowing that within one or two decades, fossil fuels will no longer be the main component of the energy mix of most countries, given their economic, environmental, and political costs. Just like we are aware of the positive value of information technology and telematics capacity as the key components of the digital economy, we also know that it can be used with criminal intent. Cybercrime and cyberterrorism are a growing challenge, leading to the development of cybersecurity policies, which are giving rise to a network of multilateral and bilateral technical cooperation agreements. 
We are following with great interest the establishment in Bucharest of the European Cybersecurity Competence Center, ECCC, and aspire to develop a close cooperation with it. There is a global governance deficit in science and technology, which is apparent in the use of data to predict behavior, a potential threat to personal pri privacy and freedoms, in the mani manipulation of the human genome, or in the handling of the planet's uh, food supply. Some of the new and interesting initiatives to deal with these issues are defining the international legal responsibility of companies and corporations, a process still under discussion at the United Nations. Another foreign policy challenge are international conflicts and the link to the diffusion of power and other issues. The prolonged uh, conflict on Syria, the crisis in the Sahel, the threats to security and stability throughout the Middle East and Africa, the war of aggression waged by Russia against Ukraine, and tensions around the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea are affecting the stability of the international system. Several of these crises are leading to the greatest uh, refugee crisis since the end of the Second World War. Chile has been a strong opponent to the unjustified Russian aggression, and we have voiced our disagreement with President Putin's action in every multilateral forum in which uh, Chile participates. We have supported every UN resolution on the matter. We have also provided some modest uh, humanitarian aid, and we are in the process of providing some more in the near future. The cause of Ukraine is very close to President Gabriel Boric's concerns. He has established a fluent communication with President Zelensky. But violent armed conflicts are not the only ailment that plagues the world or our societies nowadays. Citizen mistrust generated by scandals of corruption, abuse, growing inequality and weak public policy making have become local and global problems. Above all, ab above all, there is public discontent, a widespread distrust of the elites and the reaction of the traditional relation between citizens and authorities. The ugly face of xenophobia, protectionism and nationalism are more in the open, posing yet another challenge to our democracies. In Latin America and the Caribbean, we have witnessed the frightening impact of climate change, such as rising sea levels and warmer oceans, which scientists agree make weather phenomena like storms and droughts more destructive than they would have been in previous decades. Rich and poor are equally affected when their homes are destroyed. Thousands of dollars in damage are caused to infrastructure and their source of income disappears. Natural disasters are placing our countries, mostly middle income and poor, in the bind of having to choose between growth and rebuilding, given that due to the income per capita, their access to development cooperation from traditional donors is severely restricted. Our long-time political parties and politicians are seen as outdated and ineffective, with voters choosing new faces or not voting at all. Democracy is under siege in many of our countries, as institutional weaknesses become more apparent and the demands of growing middle class increase. All this while Latin America and the Caribbean countries continue to lead inequality indexes despite efforts to revert the situation. And then there is the COVID-19 pandemic. Even though the WHO announced the end of it, we are still struggling with its aftermath. 
The consequences have ranged from the way we interact as societies to the severe economic impact that pushed about 70 million people globally below the poverty line in the last three years, a number that has been decreasing, but it is yet to return to pre-pandemic levels. As a result, we have experienced a heightened economic slowdown a weakening in the prices of most commodities, the centerpiece of the export strategy of most Latin American economies, creating low growth and in some cases recession and also steep inflation. The new normal for Latin America and other regions would seem to be low economic growth at best and stagflation at worst. If the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 SDOs, as well as the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, had been heralded as beacons of hope, the pandemic has set us back and made more difficult the achievement of sustainable development, both at the national and the international levels by the end of the decade. In sum, the challenges we face are compounded as the new realities coexist with old ones. Historical progress is not linear. There is forward and backward movement. The new era does not prevail fully, while the old order does not disappear entirely either. The context I have just described has shaped our foreign policy in the last few years. The challenge for foreign policy makers has been to skillfully combine principles and national interests in the best way possible for addressing the complex challenges of this turbulent world. First, as a country, we believe that a successful foreign policy has to represent the government, the opposition, and other actors, and uphold permanent interests and principles. In our case, these principles are clear and long-standing, and we share them with Romania. I'm referring to respect for international law and treaties, state independence and sovereignty, the defense of territorial integrity, the promotion and defense of human rights and democracy, the peaceful settlement of disputes, and a strong commitment to multilateralism, which we define we define as a responsibility to cooperate. Recognizing this reality, Chilean foreign policy defined its areas of work at the national, regional, and global levels, but always with the same goal, sustainable development for the benefits of our citizens. Latin America is and will continue to be Chile's top priority. We speak to the world from Latin America. Our objective is to present a common view and allow for a closer interaction with other regions. We should move towards regional integration on issues such as connectivity, movement of people, trade facilitation, and disaster relief. Latin America has rich resources, conventional and green energy, vast natural reserves which are essential to address the challenges of climate change, critical minerals, vast markets, potential for services and products with added value, and great investment opportunities. However, we have to improve our ability to tap these resources. Additionally, we must contribute to global governance, particularly in the most sensitive issues for Chile, human rights, democracy, open trade, climate change, organized crime, oceans, etc. In recent years, we have seen the important uh, challenges in countries in our region. However, our countries have been able to maintain, for the most part, some of democracy's basic tenets the respect of democratic institutions, the constitutional order, and the holding of elections. But democracy, of course, 
is much more than free elections. A system of checks and balances, independence of the branches of government, civil liberties, accountability, and anti-corruption anti practices are inherent elements for democracy and allow institutions to work effectively to serve citizens, protecting and strengthening democratic processes. Since 1990, Chile's integration into the international community has been characterized by an open trade policy. The result is 33 trade agreements with 65 countries representing over 66% of the world population and over 88% of global GDP. Beside our vast network of trade agreements, we successfully launched the Pacific Alliance with Peru, Colombia, and Mexico in 2011. We, very recently, we mediated between its members to normalize the functioning of this integration scheme. Based upon our experience, the best way to build policy synergies in terms of integration, trade liberalization, and mutual investment is to create mechanisms for dialogue among countries that share values and goals, such as equality, non-discrimination, the rule of law, and human rights. Our policies towards the Asia-Pacific region continue to prosper. The Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, CPTPPP, has fully come into force, and we face the task of making the most out of it. Despite counting with FTA's uh, free trade agreements with each of, of the members, this agreement will allow us to have access to areas which were barred from before, and it also adds new dimensions to our ties, and it elevates the standards of the economic relations amongst its members. Something similar happens with the EU-Chile Advanced Framework Agreement, which is in the stage of legal scrubbing and which we expect to sign by the end of the year. This new ge uh, generation agreement with the European Union includes important topics such as sustainable development, and important innovations in areas as critical as investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. It will allow us to reinvigorate our relationship with Europe, which, with which we share common values and profound historical, political, economic, and social ties. We thank Romania for its support to this new agreement with the European Union. There are many reasons for a closer relationship between Latin American countries and Europe. History, addition to human rights and democracy, common approaches to multilateralism, economic interests. Chile has positioned itself as a regional leader in terms of the production of clean energy due to its inherent uh, natural resources and weather conditions. We strive to become a pole of development of the green hydrogen industry, and we have recently signed cooperation agreements with the European Union to further this effort. Another important element in, in this area is the national lithium strategy adopted by my country last April. This strategy fosters public-private partnerships for the responsible a sustainable extraction of this ore, at the same time that it provides a legal framework for investment that is clear, certain, predictable, non-discriminatory, and in full accordance with our trade agreements with third countries. We also believe in the importance of the transition towards greener energies and economies. We have pushed policies that will require that by 2030, at least 60% of the energy we produce comes from renewable sources, of which 40% will need to come from 
non-conventional outputs. This goes in line with achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. The government of President Boric has established the protection of the environment and the ocean within its top priorities. Even though the ocean provides for half of the oxygen we breathe and captures almost one third of global emissions, it has been largely neglected in international climate discussions. It is because of this that we are proud of actively working towards the advancement of international ocean conservation. Last June, I attended the adoption of the text of the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty, better known as BBNJ, at the UN headquarters in New York. This instrument fills in an important void in the ocean government's framework, paving the way to acquire better knowledge and guarantee equal access to the riches of the high seas. In this matter, Chile has offered to host the BBNJ Secretariat once the treaty comes into force. This is in line with the country's historical oceanic vocation and our purpose of becoming, in the words of President Boric, the world's capital for ocean protection. Ladies and gentlemen, I have addressed some, there are many more, of the issues of the present and the future that represent challenges for our foreign policies. I have also outlined some of the actions we have taken to respond. We need to find answers and new ways to solve these national, regional, and global challenges of the 21st century so that we can continue to move towards sustainable development. It will not be easy but we have no rational option but to work with each other to build a new international structure for the new realities. Thank you very much for your attention.